Today I'm going to show you my approach to fitting engineered oak wood flooring. Uh, I don't think so. Stop the presses. There's no way I'm having it 60 millimeters out of square. Surprise, surprise. Another tradesperson's Ballsed up. I hadn't even noticed that. Hiya folks, welcome back to the show. Today, as I say, I'm going to be fitting a whole bunch of engineered oak wood flooring. It is this stuff here, really nice. So it's a, a solid veneer of real wood on a, effectively a plywood backing. So it's a lot more stable, very good for kitchens and things like that, where any kind of moisture can cause problems with swelling and things for, for real wood. As per usual, this is just my approach. There's many ways of doing this. I'm doing it as a floating floor, and a floating floor means that it's not fixed down to the subfloor. It literally just floats on top. It's kind of similar to how you would do laminate flooring. The only difference is, is that with this, we're gonna be gluing every joint, and because it's not a clip floor system, we can come at it from any side, which makes life actually a little bit easier. You'll see what I mean when we come to actually fitting the flooring later on. The floorboards are gonna run in that direction, which we think will look quite good running out to the decking outside. And it'll also look good in the living room running in front of the fireplace that way as well. It's gonna run all the way through the kitchen into the living room and into the front hallway. So it all needs to be kind of done in one go. And as a result, it means that the first job we need to do is clear this room out and the living room and the hallway. So carpets are removed, skirtings are removed. The subfloor is very firmly fixed down and obviously this is a very good time to make sure you haven't got any squeaks anywhere because once the new floor is laid over the top it will be nigh on impossible to fix any squeaks. The subfloor is sound, dry and level. You're aiming generally for under 16% moisture content in the subfloor. This particular wood recommends that you install it when the relative humidity is between 40 and 55% and at the minute let's have a look. It is... <gasps> 56% but that's okay because I'm going to be doing the install tomorrow and not today and at the end of the day what's 1% between friends and it also suggests that you install it between 16 degrees and 27 degrees celsius at the end of the day we need to crack on and get this done so I don't know what you're supposed to do if the relative humidity and moisture levels are, are different to that, but there you go. We're going for a 12 millimeter expansion gap around the whole room. I've just made these 12 millimeter spaces, or you can use like normal spaces, whatever you prefer. If you've got the gear to make your own, you might as well make your own. All I did was rip down a scrap piece of timber to 12 millimeters on the table saw, and then I chopped it up on the chop saw. So then you need to work out your starting point. And in this room, because we're gonna have the boards going from left to right all the way across the entire room into the kitchen diner, most edges of the room are gonna be covered by furniture. So you're not really gonna see them, but the one place where you will really notice the edge of the flooring is in front of the hearth. So we're gonna use the hearth as our kind of reference point. We're just going for a five millimeter expansion gap around the hearth itself because anything bigger than that will just look ridiculous. We're just gonna have to hope for the best that that won't be a problem. What we've also done is we've run a string line from over here and the string line is perfectly parallel to the boards that are in front of the hearth. At the end of the day, the chances of the hearth being perfectly parallel to this wall anyway are nigh on zero. In fact, let's just quickly check that. So. Over here we are 325 millimeters from the wall and over on the other side of the room we are 268. Uh, I don't think so. Stop the presses. There's no way I'm having it 60 millimeters out of square in our brand new extension just because our 
hearth has been basically fitted on the wonk. I didn't actually realize that. I thought that this wall was just maybe not parallel to the extension wall, which it wouldn't be unheard of for an old chimney breast not to be square, but it's not that at all. Look at this. So what I've now done is I've put the boards up against the wall in the new extension. I've run a parallel string line all the way across the room, but check this out. The hearth on the left hand side of the hearth, is 265 millimeters from the wall and on the right hand side it's 280 millimeters from the wall and is it the wall to blame or is it the people who installed the hearth let's find out let's measure from the wall to our string line that we know is perfectly parallel and that is from the wall to the string that is about what 453 millimeters or thereabouts and over on the left hand side from the wall to the string is 453 millimeters. It's absolutely perfect. It's not the wall to blame. It's not the extension to blame. Surprise, surprise. Another tradesperson's balls up. I hadn't even noticed that. It's the hearth is completely on the skew. So we're just gonna have to live with that. Absolutely amazing. So complete change of plan. We're gonna start from this wall and work our way along and it means we're gonna to have to have cuts around here. It means that the boards aren't gonna be parallel to the hearth. We'll just have to put a trim around to cover the expansion gap. It means that we can have a, a proper 12 mil expansion gap though, because if we're having a trim around anyway, then we might as well have the proper expansion gap. Annoying, but not the end of the world. It actually makes the install easier. So yeah, such is life. Needless to say, the floor is immaculate. We've given it a really, really good vacuum and clean and made sure there's no nails or staples or anything like that sticking out the floor. So first job is gonna to be to get the underlay down and it's gonna go silver side down. We'll tape the edges together. I'm not gonna be mega fussy about it being 100% taped. If you are concerned about moisture leaching up from your floor, then you should maybe put a vapor barrier down as well, but uh, in this kind of situation where it's a, a subfloor, a well-ventilated subfloor, it's nice and dry. We don't really need to worry about that too much. You are gonna need spacers. I've already talked about 12 millimeter spacers for around the edges. You're gonna need a tapping block and a hammer and a tapping bar for tapping the edges. You'll see when I get onto those bits. You will need tape for the underlay. Of course, you will need a good quality tape measure. And uh, by the way, this is now available in eight meters. If you've never seen these before, you can get them on the Gothith Handyman shop. They're double-sided, metric only, so you can read them from the top or bottom, either side, so it makes it really easy to read. You will need a string line. I've got a chalk string line here and I've got some normal string just because there are parts of this where you don't want chalk getting all over the floorboards. And you will need a damp cloth to remove any excess glue. And of course you will need flooring glue, which this is specifically for engineered wood floors. We've got the multi-cutter ready to go. Something to kneel on. I do have knee pads built into my pants, but if you don't, make sure you've got something to kneel on because this is a, a killer on the knees. We've also got a straight edge and you're probably gonna need a selection of other saws and things like that. Like for example, a jigsaw, you might need a, a hand saw just for some of the more intricate cuts that you're gonna be making.
One thing briefly worth mentioning, the biggest thing that's holding us back at the minute is how quickly the glue comes out the tubes. So this normally has this little kind of hat on like that. Little tip for you is that if you take that off and if you just chop this top little bit off with a pair of snips, then the glue comes out a little bit quicker. I'm not gonna do it on that one because it does stop you from sealing the glue bottle up, but because we're gonna be getting through so much glue, this will be finished by the end of the day anyway, then there's no harm in chopping that off. Right, we've made a good start and we're up to a bit that I wanted to show you here, which is getting this really long length in all the way across the room. Because the really important thing here is that you get this perfectly straight. If you don't get this perfectly straight, you're gonna be fighting the floor all the way across the room and it just makes life generally awkward. So what I've done up the top end of the room, I've put a block screwed into the floor just with a string attached to it and the corner of that block is perfectly in line with the visible edge of the wood. Pretty much as accurate as you can get that. And then at the other end of the room, I've attached it into a screw and I've left the screw deliberately long because it makes it a bit easier to knock it left or right just to get the string absolutely perfect all the way along. Can't stress it enough, you've got to make sure this is millimeter perfect all the way along the board. So you can see there's the edge of the board just there and the string is perfectly on it. So I've been all the way along this, all the way up the whole length of the room. If I come down like this, you can pretty much see that it is as straight as a straight thing. And then all I'm gonna do is screw some stop blocks into the floor behind this to stop it from moving. We'll work then in this direction, do the rest of the floor, and we'll fill this back bit in afterwards. If possible, try and do the stop blocks well. The way I'm gonna do it is to put them on the joins like that. So we'll have one there. Uh, we'll probably have one right at the end there as well. We can't put any around the fire because there's kind of concrete underneath that. Then over on the right, we'll pop one there, one there. I've got one spare. Where should we put it? We've got a bit of a gap here. We'll, we'll pop it there. And from there, it's just a question of working across the room. I'll come back to you once we're a bit further on. So that's the stop blocks all fitted in there along with the spacers along the front anyway. We've got on fairly well with this, just to give you a very quick update of where we are so far. We've got about 15 boards in all the way across and all the way up the full length of the room. This is about a seven and a half, eight meter long run this, so it's a fairly big run. On average, it's probably taking about 15 minutes per length. And a couple of little tips as well for you. I actually found the official instructions in one of the packs. The first pack I opened didn't have these in, but what the pack recommends is that you put the glue onto the tongue. That seems to vary by manufacturer, but it is way, way quicker doing it on the tongue, especially if you've got it tongue side um, outwards, because then you can just run a, a really long bead of glue all the way along and then you've just got your ends to do as you work along the length. And the other thing as well, if you've got someone following you doing the glue cleanup so that you don't have to keep on kind of switching between jobs, that makes life way, way quicker. So we now need to move all of the wood over on the, the right hand side of the room so that we can get the underlay down on that side. And then the plan is to finish off the living room as far as we can. I'm not gonna show you all of the easy bits. I'm gonna kind of show you some of the more complicated cuts and stuff like that. I will show you um, just putting the boards in when we get a bit further along on the kitchen side, but it's the more complicated cuts that I want to show you. So I'll come back to you once we're up to some of the more interesting stuff.
What I'm also doing, because this is quite a big area that we're doing here, is that I'm trying to check that we're staying perfectly straight all the way along. So every few boards I've been getting the straight edge out and just double checking how we're doing. We're pretty good. The only thing that I've noticed is up at this top end, we're a little bit further in than I'd ideally want to be. But that's not the end of the world. So there's gonna be kitchen cabinets under here, underneath this. I should really have tidied up before filming this. Anyway, if we do have to bring it back to, to being perfectly straight, I can put some gaps in, very, very small gaps, but I can just pull it back to being in a line by putting the gaps underneath uh, kitchen cabinets where you'll never see the gaps. I'm talking about gaps that, you know, we'll have technically got a gap here, but it's so small. Here is a gap. Can you even see it? I'm not sure. But this is just where I've been kind of trying to drag it back. At the end of the day, it's a natural product and it expands and contracts and there's a tolerance on how well machined the boards are. So you are gonna run into situations where you just have to kind of make a judgment call and work out what you're doing. Everywhere else along here, we're pretty good, we're pretty straight. And as I say, once we get into the living room area over here, it's a much shorter run anyway. It's only three and a half meters across here. We're gonna end up with a bit of a sliver down this edge here. Again, not a massive problem. The, the one thing I wanted to check for is whether or not it's gonna cause a problem around the doorway because all of these boards are gonna run all the way through and into the downstairs hall. But actually, by some complete chance, it works out almost perfectly. So plan of attack now is basically get one more run in, get the little sliver all the way around there, one long run all the way down, and then I'll finish off the living room I'll have to leave the boards kind of staggered around that area because I'm not tackling the, the downstairs hall today. And then I'll tackle around the fireplace. And then once that's done, we can get the skirtings back on, get the furniture all put back into this room. And that will then let us clear the kitchen out so that we can continue running the flooring up in that direction. Another quick tip for you here, we did the living room a couple of days ago and we're following through into the hallway now and that means that we've had this kind of staggered edge sitting in a vulnerable state and this can easily get damaged because there's nothing supporting the grooves. So a little tip is just to get some leftover boards and anywhere where anyone's likely to be walking, just pop them in dry like that. And that just protects the tongues and grooves of the boards that you've already fitted so that when you come to continue the floor through, you're not trying to join onto damaged boards.
And I think we'll call that done. If you want to hold fire for the full proper reveal, then hit subscribe and uh, come back a little bit later. But I will show you the whole job finished, but bearing in mind, none of the rooms are decorated yet. None of the skirting boards are on. There's a kitchen to go over here, video coming up all about that. So the floor starts right at this end over here and it works its way all the way through, all the way through the living room and in front of the hearth over here, all the way through into the kitchen diner area in front of the bifolds and back through to the kitchen area over here, which I briefly showed you before. As I say, skirtings and trims are yet to be done, but I figured if I was going to wait for all of that to be done, we'd be waiting months for this video to come out. And I wanted to give you a bit of a real life view rather than the grand reveal view of what's actually going on here. So skirtings can simply go back on over there. Got a little bit of kind of replastering to do on this corner. There'll be a little trim in front of the doorway just to keep our expansion gap. So the trim I'm just going to be attaching in with blobs of silicon, just basically so it doesn't fall off. But you need to make sure you don't attach the trim onto the floor too strongly. Otherwise the floor can't move and it can't expand and contract. Over in this corner, again, kind of ignore what's going on here because this is all getting boxed in and tidied up in internet corner and the skirtings are still to go on. Same over here as well. I've deliberately overrun into the kind of pantry area because obviously there will be a threshold going on here, but I haven't got the threshold yet and we haven't quite decided on what flooring is going in this room. So I'll come back to that in a minute. But until I've got the threshold, I've left this long and we'll just trim it off with a multi-cutter to the correct length when we know what threshold we're actually putting there. All of our trims under the architraves and door frames look absolutely great. And once the little bits of skirting are back on, that'll look lovely. No threshold through into the living room. We've got a straight run through, still have the skirtings to put back on on that side. And then same going through into the kind of office area here. I'm going to have to put a little bit of extra uh, flooring on but again I'll do that once we've got the threshold this is a bit of a bit of a weird one because the doorway isn't straight the doorways on a bit of a slant on a bit of a wonk so obviously the threshold needs to go kind of here and this will be a, a wood floor to carpet threshold that'll be going on here but as I say that's gonna have to be an angled rip to match up to the threshold which we haven't got yet I'm particularly pleased with how the cut around the bottom of the stairs worked out. Um, that's just, there is an expansion gap there, but the carpet is basically filling up that expansion gap. And uh, yeah, you just can't tell. It looks like the carpet was put in after the floor, but that is just a cut around that edge. Through into the living room and there's a trim to go in front of the hearth. Again, retaining that 12 and a half mil expansion gap all the way around. So there'll be an oak trim going around that just to cover that up. That'll look lovely. And in front of the bifolds, there'll be a little trim going along that edge as well, just to retain the expansion gap. Materials wise, we've actually ended up with five leftover boxes of wood. Now we can potentially return those, but to be honest, I'm so happy with the way this has worked out. We might end up putting this flooring down in the pantry stroke utility area. Uh, time will tell. We need to work out if there's enough there, how much extra we'd need. But when you look at the hassle factor of returning it, we've got some leftover underlay and glue as well. Obviously we can't return the underlay because it's like a half used roll, but we might just end up keeping that and using it to be honest. It took about four days to do this complete job. And that was with Mrs. Mack helping. It would have easily taken probably six or maybe six or seven days if I had to do all the glue clean up myself. It made a massive difference having Mrs. Mack following me behind every row doing the glue clean up. It really is a two person job in that respect. Hats off to everyone who does this sort of work on a daily basis because it's really hard on the knees. It's hard on the back as well. I don't know how much you would typically charge for an install like this. Personally, for the, the amount of 
effort that goes into it. I wouldn't be charging anything under two and a half grand for just for the labor of an install like this. And depending on what part of the world you're in, you could easily be looking at what, five grand or something for the install. Let me know in the comments below what you would charge if you do a job like this. I can't remember the exact floor area, but I'll put it there. In terms of difficulty of a job like this, is it a DIYer job? Um, that's a tricky one to answer. For a, a single small room, it's relatively easy. But because we are running all the way through from a living room into a hallway with no thresholds, we're working against walls that aren't particularly straight and a fireplace that's on the wonk. My poor workshop looks like it's been shook upside down and every square inch of everything seems to be covered in offcuts of flooring. And then in the kitchen, we're working through with no threshold again, seven and a half meters in that direction. It does start to get tricky when you <laughs> struggle to keep it perfectly straight. So as I say, that really, really straight starting point is absolutely key, but you do need to keep checking it all the way across the room. You've just got to be patient, don't rush it. And at the end of the day, it's a, a beautiful product. I'm, I'm really impressed and it looks great. As I say, I don't lay floors on a regular basis. You've got flooring professionals who do this every day and they do an amazing job of this in probably half the amount of time. If you do do this on a regular basis, please pop any extra tips or helps or suggestions or comments down below. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you wanna see the final reveal of what this all looks like once everything is completely finished and decorated. For now, we will leave it there. Take care, folks. Look after one another. Be nice to each other. And we shall see you next time. Tatty bye.